Welcome to our online lifestyle medicine series. And it's been a pleasure, and it is a pleasure to have you join us. So thank you so much for finding time to join us. We also have a live audience here. Welcome, all of you. My name is Gladys Ombongi from Lisha Leo, and we are happy, we are delighted, we are humbled to be hosting Barbara O'Neill for this week from 17th to 21st, 2023, for our fourth annual lifestyle medicine series. Tonight, we are going to talk about the gut health. There are many people who always complain about this or that. I don't eat this. I have this problem. Actually, you find the allergies maybe are so many. And that's why it's really, really an honor to just be taken through the journey from of the gut height looks like and the health and practically where we can start. Thank you so much, Barbara, for finding time to be here. And Karibu Sana. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you got it. Okay, over to you. Please take us through. Thank you. Proverbs 14 verse 6 says, Knowledge is easy to him that understands. So what I want to give you tonight is an understanding of how the gut works. Because when you have an understanding of how the gastrointestinal tract works, you now have the knowledge on how to treat it. So we're going we're gonna to go on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. It's about 10 metres long, so it's quite a journey, but we will cover this journey tonight. And we begin with the mouth. The mouth is the only place where we have say over what happens in our gastrointestinal tract. We have say over what goes in. We have say over when it goes in. We have say over how often it goes in. And we have say over how long it actually stays in the mouth and we also have say over the environment of entry. And all of those decisions, as you will see, affect the whole of the gastrointestinal tract. Notice in our mouth, it's the only place we have exposed bone, and that's our teeth. And our teeth are designed to chew, chew, chew. Now, as we've been looking at this week, the mouth was not designed to breathe. It's been designed to talk, to laugh, to sing, to kiss, to chew. <laughs> and chewing the food very, very well means that we break the food down to tiny little particles and that gives a larger surface area for the enzymes to work on. But something else, when we chew very, very well, it gives an opportunity for the brain to assess what is in there. And so now it can say to the liver, we've got a bit of fat coming, our stomach, we've got a bit of protein coming, our pancreas. It gives messages so that these organs get ready for these foods. But when the person goes choo-choo swallow, choo-choo swallow, choo-choo swallow, the organs are saying, what's coming? And the brain says, I don't know. They're chewing far too fast. So it's very important to take note on the only part of your gastrointestinal tract that you have say over, which is mouth. The mouth is an alkaline environment. And there are a couple of foods where digestion begins in the mouth. Underneath the tongue, there are sublingual glands that release lingual lipase. And lingual lipase is an enzyme that breaks down saturated fat. That's the only fat that it breaks down, is saturated fat. So your saturated fat is found in coconut. There is a little bit found in macadamias and avocado. Uh, butter is a saturated fat, palm oil, shea butter, these are all saturated fats. And they are unique in that the breakdown begins, it begins in the mouth under the action of, of lingual lipase, which is released from the sublingual glands under the tongue. The other food that is broken down, or that begins the breakdown, is starch or you could say carbohydrates. So these are all your uh, pastas, breads, cereals. 
the breakdown begins in the mouth and it begins in the mouth under the action of salivary amylase and that salivary amylase is called tylen. Tylen is the enzyme that begins the starch breakdown but the tylen in the mouth is not present until the molars come through. So the first teeth that human beings get are four at the top, four at the bottom. And they appear anywhere between usually about seven to 10, 11 months of age. Now those eight teeth are called milk teeth. And the reason they're called milk teeth because that's all babies should be having. That's baby's main food is milk. But it's also taste time. There should be three things present for a baby to be able to be introduced to food. Number one is they can sit. And they usually sit about seven and a half to eight months. Number two, they can pick up the food and feed themselves. Number three, they have teeth. <laughs> How often are mothers told to give their baby cereal at six months of age? They can't sit. They can put things in their mouth. And by the way, they put anything in their mouth. And so the food is mashed up because at six months, many babies have no teeth. And it makes absolutely no sense. In fact, there are dentists that are saying it's the worst thing you can do for the development of your teeth and gum is to give a baby, um, sorry, but I don't know how else to call it, slop. I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in lying down and being fed slop. No? It makes no, no reason at all. And yet, there are no enzymes in the mouth to break down that cereal. Some claim that the baby must have some iron in the second month, second six months, because breast milk doesn't have as much iron in the second six months as the first six months. Well, I have a question here. Does God make mistakes? Mm -hmm. No, of course, God never makes mistakes. And did you know that the baby's requirements for iron in the first six months are greater than in the second six months? And so many mothers start to give their babies food then because that's what they are told. Let's have a look traditionally. Babies were never fed food until they had teeth and they could sit and they could eat. In many cultures, babies were not given food till they were nearly two. You see, when the next teeth come through, these are the molars and these are the grinders. And what do we grind? Grain. And when the molars are fully through, then tylen is released in the mouth. And so babies should have no starch until the molars are through. This is very important information for medical missionaries to have to share with mothers. So what can baby be given until then? I just used to give my babies a carrot stick or a celery stick or a piece of cucumber or a piece of apple because it's very important for their development of the teeth and the gums that they have hard food that they can chew and you'll find, remember it's taste time, you give the baby a piece of cucumber at meal time, keeps them busy so you can eat your meal and they think they're doing what you're doing. <laughs> and you'll find they'll, they'll nibble away at that cucumber and there'll little be bits of cucumber all over their tray and there'll be little bits of cucumber on the floor and a few bits of cucumber go in and they come out the other end much the same and that's perfectly fine because it's taste time. It's preparing them for the time when the molars are through and they will start chewing. Many health problems develop in human beings' guts because they were given food too young. They were given food that they could not digest. There is a little valve here and it's a double layered valve and it's called the cardiac sphincter because of its nearness to the heart muscle. And the cardiac sphincter is a double layered sphincter and it is designed to prevent acid coming up into the esophagus. Because if the acid comes up there, it has the potential to irritate and even cause ulcers 
in the esophagus. So we're now moving down to the stomach and the entry into the stomach is this little valve called the pyloric sphincter. The pH of the stomach is acid and there's a very important reason for that acid. So really the craziest thing that anyone can ever be given is antacids. Anything that will block the production of the acid because the acid is vital for the breaking down of protein. Why would someone be given something to block the acid? Because the acid keeps coming up and causing terrible discomfort. It's called reflux or heartburn. The reason for reflux or heartburn is not the odd time a person might eat it late, but every night, every night, a late evening meal, and then they lie down and gravity pushes that food in the stomach up against that pyloric sphincter. So night after night after night after week after month after year after year, it weakens. It starts to weaken that little sphincter. It weakens it to the point where the acid can start coming up into the into the esophagus. You see, gravity insists that when we eat, we be upright. And we, also, we should remain upright until that stomach is empty. When we go to sleep at night, our whole body is resting. And it's unfair to expect the stomach to be working hard while the rest of the body is at rest. But when a person has a large evening meal at night and they go to sleep, yes, it presses against that cardiac sphincter, but it also does not digest very quickly because everything slows down. And it's not unusual for that person to wake up in the morning and have no desire for breakfast because there are still remnants of that meal that they ate last night. So how can we strengthen the cardiac sphincter? and so recover from reflux. Take magnesium, because this little muscle, it looks like this. It's a muscle, and when it's relaxed, it's closed. And when it tightens, why would it tighten? With stress? When it tightens, it opens. Another thing that causes it to open is when we start chewing, and this peristalsis starts happening, and the muscles start cramping and then that cardiac sphincter opens allowing the food to go into the stomach. And so the mineral that is a muscle relaxant is magnesium. So magnesium can be taken to relax the cardiac sphincter. So to recover from reflux, have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and, and nothing at night. If you have anything at night, maybe a bowl of soup or maybe a a uh, vegetable juice, but something very light, or maybe a banana, which digests very quickly. And also making sure you're well hydrated. Hydration is necessary for the enzymes in the stomach to be made. We now enter into the stomach, which is an acid environment. The lining of the stomach looks like this, and there are glands that line the lining of the stomach. And two-thirds of these, of these glands produce mucus. And that mucus is designed to protect the stomach lining from the acid. Because down in these little cells here, hydrochloric acid is released. And hydrochloric acid if it were to touch your skin, it would burn a hole in your skin. So God designed in his ultimate wisdom this thick mucosa wall that lines the stomach. But from these cells here are released the enzymes that break down the protein. So one is hydrochloric acid, another one is pepsinogen. And pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid unite and release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that begins the breakdown of protein. That's the only thing that is broken down in the stomach. 
The starch digestion slows down, even though it began in the mouth, it slows down when it hits this acid environment. But as we will see as we go further on, it revives again when we get to another part of the gut, which is alkaline. When someone is drinking with their meals, they dilute the stomach acid. And when the acidity of the stomach is diluted, hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen cannot connect. And even if some pepsin is produced, pepsin can only, it can only be activated in a very acid environment. So what happens with a lot of people with reflux? The antacids happen and we've got food now sitting in the stomach unable to be broken down effectively. It starts to ferment and then the fumes come up and that can also add to the discomfort of reflux. So what would delete or what would uh, compromise hydrochloric acid or the production of hydrochloric acid. Eating all day long, drinking with the meals, eating the largest meal at the end of the day, stress, being very stressed out. All of these things bit by bit contribute to a depletion of the hydrochloric acid. The research shows that with many people, hydrochloric acid de depletes as, as people age, but there is no need for that to happen. It depletes with age because of their lifestyle habits. And it's so common that the research basically says this is going to happen, but not so. So how can you boost hydrochloric acid levels? Eat breakfast like a king. Chew very, very well. When you chew very well, you make it so much easier on the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. Chew very, very well. Drink between meals, not with meals. Have most of your food at breakfast and lunch. Something else is released in these little glands called the parietal glands, and that is the intrinsic factor. And the intrinsic factor is required to be able to digest vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is linked in food with an R protein. Hydrochloric acid releases the R protein from B12 and the parietal glands release the intrinsic factor. Say this is the intrinsic factor. So B12 and the intrinsic factor, they float together all the way down the small intestine till they get to the ileum, the last part of the small intestine. And what happens then is the intrinsic factor and the B12 connect and they're absorbed into the enterohepatic circulation which is a circulatory system that keeps the B12 in motion and it's just accessed when it's needed. So most people with B12 deficiency, it's because they lack hydrochloric acid to release the R protein. And if they lack hydrochloric acid, it's quite common that they will also lack the intrinsic factor. Why would that be? Eating all day long, eating the largest meal at the end of the day, drinking with their meals, stressing while they're eating. In fact, I love, I love the, from the writings of Ellen White where she says, cast off care and anxious thought when you sit to <coughs> dine. That's, a, that's an important point. No controversial issues are to be discussed at the evening meal. Well, we're not having an evening meal. At the dinner table. <laughs> because that can have quite a devastating effect on the digestion of everyone who's sitting at the table. You can laugh, you can sing, although it's a bit hard to sing while you're eating. But keep, keep it a happy time at the table. And so, as you can see, the only, only digestion that happens in the stomach is protein. And now we're moving down through a little, a little gate at the end of the stomach called the pyloric sphincter. And we move through the pyloric sphincter into the, into the first part of the small intestine. 
The pyloric sphincter, when we wake up in the morning, especially if we went to bed with no food in our stomach, it lays open. So warm water in the morning is the best to uh, help every cell in the body with its water, its water requirements. But when we smell food, think food, the pyloric sphincter shuts and the food comes in and the pyloric sphincter stays shut. It seems that the pyloric sphincter has little sensors and when it senses that the food is broken down to a certain state, then the pyloric sphincter will open and little by little let the food go. If someone has low hydrochloric acid, then the food's not getting down bro broken down at the rate that it should be, so pyloric sphincter stays shut. That's why one sign that someone has low hydrochloric acid is they feel like they've just eaten a meal and they ate the meal five hours ago. And sometimes bloating because the food's not getting broken down, it begins to ferment. Now there's a lot happening in the first part of the small intestine. In the first part of the small intestine, you'll see that the liver, the liver sits under your right rib. Underneath the liver is the gallbladder and the gallbladder is a reservoir for bile. The bile is made in the liver and the gallbladder basically just holds it. It's a holding station for bile. And you can see that the common bile duct comes down, connects with the neck of the pancreas. So let's have a look first at the liver because there's a lot happening in the duodenum. In the duodenum, it now becomes an alkaline environment. And liver releases bile, and bile is the enzyme that breaks down the polyunsaturated fats. Remember where the saturated fats were broken down? They started in the mouth. But the polyunsaturated fats, which many which many vegetarian or plant-based fats are polyunsaturated fats. All your nuts and your seeds are predominantly polyunsaturated fat. And so the bile emulsifies the fat or breaks it down into tiny particles. So what's also happening in the duodenum is the pancreas. The pancreas releases sodium bicarbonate to ensure that the duodenum stays alkaline. So the sodium bicarbonate is not involved in digestion, but it's released to ensure that it's, that it's alkaline here. Because as you can imagine, when the food's coming out of the stomach, it's mixed with the acid uh, pepsin. So the pancreas, it releases a few things. It releases pancreatic lipase. Now remember what lipase is? Lipase is the enzyme that breaks down fats. So pancreatic lipase further breaks down the polyunsaturated fats. The bile emulsifies it and the pancreatic lipase further breaks the fats down. The pancreas also releases pancreatic amylase. Pancreatic amylase finalizes the starch digestion. Now, do you remember starch digestion? It began in the mouth under the action of the salivary amylase, tylen. And now, remember it was starch digestion began, but it was put on hold in the acid environment of the stomach. And now we're in the alkaline environment of the duodenum and pancreatic amylase is released, which finalizes the starch digestion. The pancreas also releases trypsin. And trypsin is an enzyme that finalizes protein digestion. So the pancreas doesn't just release the sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the stomach acid, it releases pancreatic lipase to break down the polyunsaturated fat after it was emulsified by the bile. Pancreas also releases pancreatic amylase, the enzyme that finalizes starch digestion. Pancreas releases trypsin, 
which is an enzyme that finalizes protein, but it also releases chymotrypsin. So it releases two different types of trypsins to finalize protein digestion. So students, I have a question for you. Which organ of the gastrointestinal tract is the main organ of digestion? The pancreas. Before I studied this, I thought everything got digested in the stomach. Mm -hmm. But it is not so. In fact, some digestion even begins in the mouth. And this explains why if someone has pancreatic cancer, ah, a compromised pancreas, they often die very quickly of malnutrition. Can you see why? Because the pancreas is not working properly, it can't finalise digestion. And if you can't finalise digestion, the nutrients can't get out of the gut and into the blood and thus to the cell. So the person dies of malnutrition. I've got some good news. It's not going to get any more complicated than this. <laughs> now the enzymes that break down protein are called proteolytic enzymes. So let's have a look at what the proteolytic enzymes are. One proteolytic enzyme is pepsin because it breaks down protein. The other proteolytic enzymes are trypsin and chymotrypsin. So we'll just say the trypsins the family of trypsins. But God in his goodness and mercy has put some proteolytic enzymes in some foods. One is called bromelain and that comes from the core of the pineapple. I was recently staying in a house where they had pineapple for breakfast and they cut all the edges of the pineapple and were about to throw away the core and I went, ah! Don't throw the core away. And they said, it's hard. <laughs> if you cut each slice of pineapple like that and then cut each slice in little wedges, everybody just gets a tiny little bit of the core and then the sweet flesh on the edge. So that's a lovely way to eat the pineapple and everyone gets a little bit. It's called bromelain. Bromelain is the enzyme that is found in the core of the pineapple. And also the seed of the papaya or the pawpaw contains papain. And that is also a proteolytic enzymes. We don't advise black pepper, it is an irritant. And some people really miss their black pepper. So what you can do, you can save the seeds out of the papaya or the pawpaw dry them and put them in your pepper grinder. They look just like pepper and they taste a bit like it too, they're very hot. <laughs> so instead of the black, the black pepper interfering with digestion and being an irritant to the gut, all your guests putting the black pepper on, well, what they think is black pepper, <laughs> will actually aid digestion. So if someone has pancreatic cancer or a compromised pancreas, the best thing they can do is take digestive aid. And most digestive aid tablets you buy or digestive enzymes you will find have bromelain and papain in them. If they have porcine in them, P-O-R-C-I-N-E, I do not advise that because it's enzymes from the stomach of the pig. Yes, not very nice. <laughs> but you can get bromelain and papain. And now we come to the grand finale of digestion. Lining the small intestine are villi. And these villi basically look like this. And up the middle of the villi is the lacteal. 
That's part of the lymphatic system. And all through the villi are the little blood capillaries. So it basically looks like this. You see, our gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube. And anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me until it gets broken down and absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you and me. The Bible says in Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the food that we eat has no use until it gets out of our gut and into the blood. My skin is an external environment because it's outside of my body. Your gastrointestinal tract is an external environment too because anything that goes in there is not part of you till it gets out of the gut and into the blood. That's why knowing how the gastrointestinal tract works is pivotal to knowing how to access, access the nutrients that are in your food. How sad to spend money on organic food and to learn how to prepare it in the most healthful manner but not be able to access the nutrients. So digestion, enhancing proper digestion is just as important as buying good quality food and preparing it in the most healthful manner. When we were in our mother's wombs, our gut was sterile. But when we were born, we were literally shelled with our mother's microorganisms. I was uh, watching a documentary by a, um, by a group of doctors talking about digestion, specifically gut flora. And the two main gut floras are called as, uh, um, Lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidus bacterium, called the healthy or the friendly bacteria. But in a baby, in utero, there is no gut flora. And there's one endocrinologist who was on this show. He said, we always thought God made a mistake when he put the anus and the birth canal so close. He said, what we have been doing for the last 50 years is if a woman comes in to have a baby, we give her an enema because we want to clean the bowel out because we don't want anything coming out of there when this little baby's born. But he said, we now know it's a perfect design. And if you know and love God, you know it's a perfect design. When the birth canal stretches open, so does the anus. And when the baby is born, the air coming out of the anus is one of the first things a baby breathes. <laughs> And that is an important part of it populating the baby's gastrointestinal tract. Because at the same time as inhaling, it's also swallowing and giving its first little, little murmur. They used to smack babies to make them cry. I did a lot of, had a lot of home births with my babies. I never allowed that. I let the babies breathe naturally. And there's no need for them to hurry up and breathe because they're still connected to you by their umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. They're still getting oxygen through there. So notice what the endocrinologist said. We now know it's a perfect design. What they have found that when babies are born via caesarean section, their gut can have skin flora in it instead of gut flora. Mm -hmm. And the first three days after the baby's born, the breasts release colostrum. It's a very thick substance, a thick yellowy substance, and it's rich in gut flora. And that's why a mother should never have antibiotics in pregnancy, because if she does, it will compromise her gut flora. So when her baby's born, her baby will get compromised gut flora. When I say never, I'm, of course, not referring to a mother that might be on death's door and an antibiotic might save a life. But the majority of women should not need to take an antibiotic in pregnancy. And so what happens now is that flora populates the gut and it acts like a thick turf wall covering 
the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. That gut flora now plays a very important part in the final part of digestion. That gut flora is responsible for the final breakdown of food, particularly a release of the B vitamins. That gut flora is responsible for the absorption of the nutrients out of the gut and into the blood. This gut flora protects the blood against any harmful pathogens that may be in the gut. This gut flora nourishes. Check. It nourishes the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, he didn't know what I have shown you here, but he said, all disease begins in the gut. So what would cause a breakdown in this gut flora? Because as you can see, it is a very important part of digestion. Antibiotics kill it off. All your statin drugs, your cholesterol-lowering drugs, kill it off. Long-term painkiller use, kill it off. Refined sugar kills it off. So there are many today with a compromise in their gastrointestinal tract because of a killing off of this very important gut flora. That's why every, every country that I visit, when I look at their traditional food, they have a cultured food. It might be sauerkraut, it might be the sourdough bread, it might be yogurt, it might be kefir, it might be kimchi. There's a whole variety of cultured foods. And what those cultured foods do, they help to maintain good gut flora. Most of our food has been absorbed halfway, do, halfway down our small intestine. The only thing that's left is insoluble fibre. And that insoluble fibre, as you will see when we get to the large intestine or the colon, that insoluble fibre is very important to have a house cleaning role in the, in the large intestine. So all that's really left by the time we get down to the end of the small intestine, which is the ileum, is the insoluble fibre. And there's a double layered valve down here. And that double layered valve is designed so that nothing from the colon goes back into the small intestines. Notice this little organ down the bottom, it's called the appendix. Once again, God never makes mistakes. The appendix has an important role in the functioning of the colon. The appendix is called the colon's oil can because it releases an oil that helps to lubricate the contents as it goes through the colon. Plus, the appendix releases antibacterial fluid so that if anything coming out of the small intestine is a little bit toxic, it calms it down. Why would it be toxic? Dog's gastrointestinal tract is one metre long. So when they eat meat, that when it breaks down, it putrefies, it's in and out quick. But ours is 10 metres long. So when people are eating meat in their diet, what's coming out of the small intestine can be quite toxic. The only way it's not too toxic is if the person eats a lot of vegetables with it because vegetables ferment and that can somewhat counteract the putrefaction process. Now let's say the person had a large meat diet and then they had some wine with it, then they finished with a bowl of ice cream. That sugar just feeds the putrefaction process. And sometimes that poor appendix overworks. And when it overworks, it gets tired and inflamed and the appendix swells, there's your appendicitis. And especially that that is compounded on this refined, high sugar, high meat diet because the colon's not moving very fast because there's no fibre in all of that. And so if you get a build-up 
of in the contents of here, and that put, puts more pressure on the appendix. No wonder people have appendicitis. One lady told me that her, her right, and as you can see by this, our appendix is on the right side near our hip. And so is a woman's ovaries, one ovary either side. And she had cysts on her ovaries and the doctor took the ovary out. And when she woke up from the operation, he said, oh, while I was there, I took your appendix too, just in case. Eee! Do you remember what Dr. Kellogg did? He did everything possible to try and avoid surgery. Everything possible because there's so much that can be done. <clears throat> if someone has appendicitis, that's where you need the ice packs. <laughs> you need the ice packs to get that swelling down. And the person can be given an enema. Now an enema might be just one and a half to two cups of water going in and that'll clear out this much. And then maybe 15 minutes later they have another enema and that enema will go up a little bit further and then empty this. And usually by the third, maybe fourth enema, the water gets right around here and that empties the colon and takes pressure off. So that's two things that can be done if someone is suffering from appendicitis. Coal packs, deep breathing, remember God's LSD, long, slow, deep, always through the nose which relaxes because when someone's in pain, often their, their body, their muscles get very tight. So relax, breathe deeply, ice that appendix and do several enemas and often that is enough to, to avert the danger of a swollen appendix. And now we come into the colon and the colon basically it's not part of digestion, so to speak, because all the food was digested here. So the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed. Because when the contents of the small intestine comes into the large intestine, it's mostly liquid. And so one of the functions of the colon is to take water out to form stools. So I'm going to show you now some of the things that help the colon and some of the things that certainly can interfere with colon function. So because the colon, as you can see, has many folds and many corners, a high fibre diet is important for the sweeping of the colon. But a high fibre diet is not just important for the sweeping of the colon but also stimulating peristalsis which is movement through the colon. So when you consider that our colon is 10 metres long, a person can be uh, having a meal in here and then there might be another meal just previously entering here and after the meal then they might evacuate that the meals two meals ago. As Dr. Kellogg said, three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. Two intakes of food a day, two evacuations a day. When we, when we eat a meal and the stomach starts massaging and moving that meal, that stimulates peristalsis all the way down the gastrointestinal tract. So the most natural time to evacuate is straight after a meal. One lady said to me, I don't know what's the matter with my gut. Every time I eat, I've got to go to the bathroom and I, I lose the meal. I said, no, you don't lose that meal. <laughs> you probably lose the previous meal or the meal before that because we've got 10 metres there. <laughs> That's, that's a long way down. And so the most natural time to go is after a meal. So there are some basic laws for the colon. And probably one of the most basic is to promptly answer nature's immediate call. Got that? <laughs> when the body speaks, we must listen. 
There's a little muscle right at the end of the gastrointestinal tract and that little muscle holds up the last part of the colon. It's, Paul, it's called puborectalis. And we're very glad that it is there because it helps prevent accidents. And when you feel to go, it means that this last part of the colon has filled and there's pressure on the anus. And if you don't go, and unfortunately many people do this, they're watching a movie and they want to wait till the end of the movie. They're on a phone call and they want to wait till the end of the phone call. They're reading a book and they're just getting to an exciting part. And so they'll go when they've finished the book or they're, they're in the middle of, you know, maybe a lady's ironing a whole heap of shirts and yes, yeah, she'll go when she's finished ironing the shirts or she's digging a garden or the man's digging. I'll go when I finish this. And there are many people that do that. When the body speaks, they think, oh, I'll go in a minute, I just want to finish this task. And then they finish the task and they go and sit and have you noticed, nothing happens. Because what happens is, if you don't go when you get the feeling to go, that cannot stay there. Because the body knows it will cause too much pressure, which will weaken the anus. So what happens is, it goes back here. And more water gets taken out. And when too much water gets taken out, then the contents goes like rabbit pellets or cement. So it's very important to promptly answer nature's immediate call. We're very glad that if the pla plane's allowed to land and you're not allowed to get out of your seat and you really need to go, we're very glad that you can stop it. And it's not the odd day you might do that or the odd day you don't. It's what you do every day that, that tells the story. So it's very important to answer nature's immediate call. What also is important is laughter. Proverbs 17.22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine but a broken spirit dries up the bones. I'd like to suggest that a broken spirit dries up the colon too. <laughs> it's important to relax, and that relaxes the colon. I'm a colonic irrigation therapist. My teacher, she has passed now, she was in her late 80s when she taught me 25 years ago. She used to say, tight mind, tight colon. So it's important to relax for the colon. That's why laughter is good medicine. The colon also needs fibre. Your highest fibre foods are really your fruits and your vegetables. For those who've made a decision to reduce the fruit intake in their diet because maybe they are conquering cancer or they have a yeast problem or they are a diabetic or they're wanting to lose weight, their fibre can come possibly more from the vegetables. So all your fruits and vegetables are very high fibre. And because one of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed, it's important to drink adequate water. I have known people that have had constipation purely because they're not drinking enough water. We had one pathologist do our program and he said, we did studies on, on coffee and you need five cups of water to accommodate for the dehydrating agents in one cup of coffee. Ooh. And when you consider that, most people today are dehydrated. And most people think that if you go once a day, that's enough. But I have met people who go once every three days. We had one lady that attended our program, she went once a week. That's like not emptying the garbage bin every day. How would your kitchen smell? And by the way, the, the body odour and the breath of that lady was most unpleasant. What's also important is exercise. Now this sounds like we're getting close to sustain me, doesn't it? A good way to sustain your colon. Exercise massages the colon. 
So every walk that you take, the colon is moving. If you're on the trampoline or the rebounder, every jump you take is massaging the colon. Your Pilates or core strengthening type exercise, they're massaging the colon. Exercise tones and strengthens the colon. But exercise also increases blood supply to the colon. So exercise is important for proper colon health. One more is position. So what do I mean by position? Let me show you. So we have here the throne and we have a person sitting on the throne for their morning evacuation. And when a person sits on the throne like thus, then this little muscle, pubo rectalis, remains taut. But if the person sits on the throne and in the front of the throne is a little stool, so that when they sit on the throne, they're in the squatting position, pubo rectalis opens. And when pubo rectalis opens, then the colon is able to open up and the contents pass with much greater ease. And in many cultures today, they still practice squatting. I've been in different parts of Africa. I have been in... Uh, Singapore, in India, and I have seen some toilets, it's a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. When I stayed in New Delhi the night before I flew out, I stayed in a four bedroom, sorry, a four story apartment with a family and it was very beautiful, it was, had a lot of pink marble and when they showed me my bathroom, <laughs> uh, it was all beautifully tiled but it was just a hole in the ground. And of course, with a hole, you squat. It's the most natural way to do the daily evacuation. And science now shows that it's because of this muscle, pubo rectalis. And when you squat, it relaxes so you can pass with greater ease. It also takes all the pressure off the anus. Now, let's say someone's sitting on their thrown for their daily evacuation and they're a bit concerned because they didn't go yesterday so they strain. It's the worst thing you can do because all the pressure goes on the anus. And then what happens is hemorrhoids happen and they're incredibly uncomfortable and even painful. But when you squat there is actually no need to strain at all because the whole body opens and it takes pressure off the anus. So it's a great way to prevent hemorrhoids and it's a great way to help heal from having hemorrhoids. In Australia, you can buy squatty potty, <laughs> which is like a little stool that wraps around the toilet, or you can buy just a little plastic stool to sit in front of the toilet. But it's a great tool to have to help with colon health. I think we will call a break now mm -hmm. and after the break, when we come back, I'm going to have a look at how you can uh, heal from constipation. I'm going to look at how you can heal from irritable bowel and Crohn's disease. And we're also looking at some of the things that you can do for, for the hemorrhoids. So we'll have a five minute break, shall we? Mm -hmm. And when we come back, we'll look at those diseases.
I'm Barbara O'Neill and I have been in, in Nairobi all week giving meetings at the Lifestyle Medical Centre at Le Chaleo. And on Saturday afternoon, I'm going to be at Sitem Buru Buru. And you are very welcome to come. You can book a slot by sending your name to the bottom of the YouTube channel. I look forward to seeing you there. Welcome back, where we continue our investigation of the gastrointestinal tract. We've been on quite a journey this evening, and we've gone all through the stomach, all through the small intestine. We've come out of the small intestine into the large intestine or the colon. And we've already looked at some of the principles that we need to adhere to, ensure that our colon is working well, like promptly answer nature's immediate call to drink adequate water, to have a plant-based diet with all the fibre to move things through, and to relax, laughter. What happens if you're already doing all of this and yet the colon is not going? So I'm going to give you the story to illustrate. We had a lady attend our program who was a psychologist. <laughs> She was in her late 60s and she'd had a lot of trouble going to the toilet for many years to the point where she only went once a week with help. She would take this medicine that just irritated and caused everything to go. And so when she came to our retreat, we did a few things. We put a castor oil compress on her abdomen and we, we demonstrated this when we did our um, poultice night a few lectures ago. And we also got her to sit in hot water, sit in cold water. We looked at this when we looked at our water therapy a few presentations ago. And that's three minutes in the hot, 30 seconds in the ice cold, and that is done three times. 
and that gives a massive blood boost to the colon area. We also gave her some herbs and the herbs that we gave her, and I'll write down the mix, it's one part cascara sagrada, we'll just say cascara. It's a bark and two part buckthorn. Buckthorn is also a bark and three part licorice. Licorice is also, well it's not quite a bark, it's more a root. And those dried herbs are mixed together in a jar and the recipe is one teaspoon to one cup of water and it's gently simmered. And we gave her three cups of this a day. These herbs gently stimulate peristalsis. Most people find that half a cup or one cup a day is enough for the, for the colon to evacuate. But this lady needed three cups a day. She had a very stubborn colon. And so she started going twice a day. She was very happy. She had not known such a thing. Within four days, the whites of her eyes became white. The skin on her face, which had had a grey look, became pink. It was incredible how so many things changed in her body. By the end of the week, she said, my mind is so clear. She said, maybe this is the problem with a lot of my patients. <laughs> Remember, she's a psychologist. When the colon doesn't work, it affects the whole body. She emailed me a few months later. She said she took three cups of tea a day and she maintained evacuating twice a day. But after six weeks, she started going four times a day. So she brought it back to two cups a day. After six weeks, she started going four times a day. So she brought it back to one cup a day. Going on like this, she told me that within, I think it was about five months, she was going without any help. The beauty of these herbs is they gently stimulate peristalsis. You might only be able to get cascara. I'm not sure what herbs you would be able to get here in Kenya. You might even find that there'll be a herbal mix in the health food shop that has herbs, maybe more grown in Kenya. I do know that one lady told me she could get little dried aloe uh, chips and she would take one of those and it would help her go. Another mixture that can help is the chia seed. And you mix a chia seed, probably one part chia to six parts water. If you drink a whole cup of that, that will often help to get things moving. And so these herbs, little by little, can help the colon to begin moving well. Now what this lady had already done, in the meantime, she had learned how to sustain her colon, sustain me. Putting the colon in the sun every day, lying in the sun and letting the sunshine penetrate deep. Use of water, she began to drink more water, she stopped her coffee. Sleep, she started to go to bed early, in the early parts of the night is when most of the healing happens no matter what part of the body. Trust in God. She started to trust in God. She started to not take stress. She stopped her stimulants. She stopped her meat. Meat has no fiber. <laughs> Refined sugar has no fiber. Many drugs dehydrate the body. Many drugs as their side effect, it's constipation. She made a decision to stop anything that would dehydrate and cause her colon to stop. She began to breathe deeply through her nose, way down in her abdominal muscles. When you breathe with your abdominal muscles, you're actually giving the colon a gentle massage every time you that, that were helpful to the body, but maybe not helpful in large amounts. She started to exercise. Implementing an exercise program exercised the colon. And because she implemented the simple lifestyle rules or laws, Florence Nightingale called them laws of nursing, Dr. Jackson called them laws of life, 
They're the basic true remedies and they can be applied to any problem in the body. Because she had implemented this at the same time as taking the herbs, she eventually did not need the herbs. What about if someone has irritable bowel or Crohn's disease, colitis, gastritis, which is irritation of the gastrointestinal tract? And it's usually indicated by the person going even 10 times a day and it liquid. We had a, we had a man from Kenya do our program at Misty Mountain. He and his wife were living in, in Australia now. He had severe irritable bowel. He was on medication. He was on cortisone, which stops the inflammation. He was also on anti-inflammatory drugs, but he was still going four or five times a day. He still had cramps when he went, and he still had some bleeding from the colon. And he was having the five irritants. <laughs> These five irritants are like kerosene to a fire. Peanuts, dairy, he liked cheese, he was having a lot of cheese. You see, our, our body is not as hot as a griller. You put cheese under a griller, it'll melt. Well, let, no, our body's not that hot, so it's like a sludge in our colon, the cheese. He was also having a lot of bread, a lot of wheat. And these things, as I said, are like irritants to the colon. So at Misty Mountain, we don't serve any of those foods. And we gave him a herb called Slippery Elm. And Slippery Elm is the powdered bark of the Slippery Elm tree. And Slippery Elm coats and soothes the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. We gave it to him four times a day. After 24 hours, I said to him, how are things in the colon? He said, good. He was very shy. And I think in his culture, you don't talk about these things. He would just smile and nod. <laughs> and so I asked one of the male therapists, I said, could you talk to him? I think it's embarrassing for him to talk to a woman about these things. So in privacy, the, um, Howard talked to him. And he said, well, he told me he's not cramping anymore. He told me he's not bleeding from the colon anymore. He's actually very, very happy. <laughs> so Monday, Tuesday are juicing days. And on Wednesday, we start eating. And our guests break the fast on some steamed vegetables and some raw vegetables. And I said it would be better if you have mostly steamed vegetables rather than the raw because the raw can, can be irritating. He was very happy because he started to only evacuate twice a day. He hadn't known such a thing. It now started to take form, the stools. He had no more cramping, no more bleeding. That's very quick. And I said to him, I can't tell you what to do with your medication, but I can tell you what I would do. I would stop the anti-inflammatories. Don't stop the cortisone. Just stop the anti-inflammatories. Now, if you stop the anti-inflammatories and he started going four times a day, you've got a choice. You can go back on the anti-inflammatories or just double the dose of the slippery on. But actually, he didn't. He didn't have any reaction at all. So my suggestion to him was that because everything was going so well, to go and visit his doctor and tell him what was happening in the colon and talk to the doctor about slowly coming off the cortisone. <laughs> if someone's on 20 milligrams of cortisone, they might come down to 15. And then after two weeks, maybe down to 10. And the body will, the body will tell you. But can you see what he'd done? He had stopped the things that were irritating the colon. And now little by little, he could come off his medication. He went home a very happy man. He had no more interest in cheese. He had no more interest in bread. He had no more interest in the, the sugar biscuits that he used to enjoy because he'd, he was no, no more suffering. <laughs> no more suffering. And as he changed his diet, he found that his taste changed. And we have seen many people conquer 
those diseases of irritation in the colon. Now I don't know whether you can get slippery elm in, in Kenya. You, you can? Because there is another herb called aloe vera. And I know that aloe vera is common. But when there's irritation of the lining of the gut, one must be very careful that they don't have any of that yellow sap that lines the leaf. It must just be the clear gel in the middle because the yellow sap can have an irritant to it. And we have seen many people conquer these colon problems. So now we're coming down to the last part of the, of the colon where hemorrhoids can happen. So what can you do for hemorrhoids? Well, using that little stool is very important. Also on a plant-based diet so that we prevent constipation because hemorrhoids are often the result of constipation. Starting to drink more water, starting to stop the stimulants. And as I showed you with the story of the lady, the castor oil compresses can be very good. So even the people with the irritable bowel, the sitting in the hot, the sitting in the cold, the sitz baths can help. And also with irritable bowel, the castor oil can help. We had one lady attend our program and she was the wife of a doctor. She had irritable bowel and she said, I did not like what my husband was suggesting. <laughs> so she said, I'd heard about castor oil and I just wore castor oil compresses. And she conquered the irritation by wearing the castor oil compresses. The castor oil compresses can be used again and again and again, even for a couple of months because they are just a vehicle holding the oil so that it can go into you. And wherever the castor oil goes, it softens, it cleanses and it stimulates healing in the area and it breaks up any old build-up, it breaks up any unnatural formations. I have met people who had appendicitis maybe in their 20s and now they're in their 30s and the scar tissue is causing them pain. Well the castor oil can help break up that, that scar tissue. But back to hemorrhoids. Some simple treatments that you can do for the hemorrhoids is the sitting in the hot and the sitting in the cold, the alternating. Now if someone's a little bit sensitive around the anus area, you can get a little blow up pillow to sit on the bottom of the bath when you sit, when you sit to do the alternating hot and colds. And you can also make some suppositories that can be inserted into the anus. And there are a couple that you can make and one is you can make one out of aloe vera. So to make it out of aloe vera you get the gel from the middle of the leaf and you make a slab about the size of the little finger and then you freeze that. And when it's frozen, then it's easy to insert into the anus. And that aloe vera coats and it soothes and it stimulates healing in that area. The other thing that can be done is to make a suppository out of castor oil. To do that, you get a cotton bud, or cotton ball I should say, a little ball of, of soft cotton, and moisten it with castor oil and mould it into the area into a shape like the little finger and then freeze that. Now that may take three days to freeze. So in our, in our freezer at Misty Mountain Health Retreat we have little containers of frozen aloe, we have little containers of frozen castor oil suppositories so that if people come and they have this problem they can insert it before they go to sleep at night. As it melts, then the herbs, whether it be castor oil or whether it be aloe, it softens and coats and soothes the area. And then in the morning evacuation, then it will be released out. So there are some simple treatments that you can do to, to help uh, ease the pain of, of hemorrhoids. And so ends our journey through the gastrointestinal tract. So any problem at any stage through the gastrointestinal tract, the aloe vera is a wonderful aid for healing. Because lining the gastrointestinal tract from the top to the other end, it 
it is a, a, like a slime like the aloe vera. It's almost as if God made that herb particularly for this. Although as we looked at last night, the aloe vera can be great on the skin too for skin burn, uh, whether it be a fire burn or whether it be a sunburn. It can also be very good for rashes. So for many reasons, the aloe is an excellent herb to have, to have in the home. And it can be used very, very quickly. I'm wondering if there are any, any questions as we, as we finish our journey through the gastrointestinal tract. I find it an interesting journey because there are so many people that have problems in the gastrointestinal tract. So we've looked at how you can heal your uh, low hydrochloric acid with a little bit of lemon juice or with a little bit of cayenne pepper. So another question might be ulcers in the stomach. Well, that's where the aloe is very soothing and healing. And remember, when you cook vegetables, you soften the fibre. So whenever there's irritation anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract, the, the uh, cooked vegetables are probably the best. Question. We have some questions. Okay, thank you so much for that interesting lesson. We've learned many things <laughs> and we hope to apply them. So, yes, we're going to go to the audience, but I want to start with the online audience. We have a question from Betty Gisori. This is what she's asking. My eldest child has had her teeth after turning one year. She, however, sat, would stretch out for food much earlier. What would you recommend for food in this case? You know, children will reach out for anything. In fact, if they're in the garden and find a caterpillar, they'll eat it. <laughs> I changed my crawling baby's nappy once and there were a red and a green crayon and three gum nuts in her nappy. <laughs> They'll eat anything. So when the child's reaching for things, they're just wanting to do what you're doing. The child has no sense. But we have sense and we know that that baby cannot have the bread, cannot have the rice, and so you just give the baby what you know the baby can handle, which would be a carrot stick, which would be a celery stick, which would be a piece of apple. And it takes them a long time to, to gum away on that. And usually by then you've finished the meal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's also another question from a viewer. Lillian, she's asking, what is the root cause of gray hair on a three-year-old boy? Ah, I would investigate that. Grey hair and a three-year-old boy. They're sure it's not blonde. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I would be interested to, to know if the first hair was grey mm -hmm. or if it had colour. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. She has another question too. What are the sources of probiotics? Uh, best sources of natural probiotics would be the cultured foods like sauerkraut, which is cultured cabbage, uh, yogurt, and you can get very nice coconut yogurts, you can get organic soy yogurts. I know in Australia you can even get almond yogurts, mm -hmm. so uh, you can get many different types of yogurts. Miso, which is the uh, cultured soybean paste that Japanese use to flavour things. Mm -hmm. So there are many types of cultured foods. Another question, uh, what about sources of vitamin B12? Sources of, of vitamin B12? Uh, Dr Neil Nedley is an American Seventh-day Adventist doctor and he's written a book called Proof Positive. It's a big thick book and it's an excellent resource book for <coughs> for people teaching health. And he, he quotes research in there that shows that organically grown root vegetables contain B12. Mm -hmm. As an airborne bacteria, you can get B12 off uh, when you eat fruit straight off the tree mm -hmm. because it's an airborne bacteria. And we have one more question. What might cause persistent hiccups? What might cause persistent hiccups? 
So the hiccups are like a little uh, regular cramp mm -hmm. in this area. And sometimes it's eating too fast and taking air in and usually holding your breath um, can help to uh, resolve the hiccups. I know my mother used to tell me to drink water upside down. Okay. You know, drink <laughs> water like this. Mm -hmm. And then an another friend of mine, he's found that orange juice helped to, to clear up hiccups. Mm -hmm. So one would have a look that the, the person that's getting hiccups regularly, whether they're eating too fast or whether they're a bit stressed with their meal. Okay. Thank you so much. That's what we have from our online audience. And I now want to go to our live audience here. Let's see, any questions that we have <coughs> this evening? Okay. Thank you, that was so informative. I would ask on uh, IBD or IBS. Uh, there are treatment programs that I've read that uh, contraindicate raw food. And we, uh, second to that, we also know the gut healing effects of lignans from flax seeds. But in IBD, they also contraindicated. What can you say? So, um, what you say about the raw food being contraindicated, meaning the raw food is not a good thing to take with irritable bowel. When you think of irritable bowel, IBS is irritable bowel, just imagine if you'd lost the top layer of skin and your skin was raw. That's what the gut is like when you've got irritations. And when you cook vegetables, it softens the fibre. And so people with irritable bowel, I advise not having raw food. And the reason why the, the um, flaxseed are called a contraindication is when there's whole flaxseed. So those whole flax seeds could maybe irritate, but if the flax seed is ground, um, there should be no problem. Mm -hmm. And the flax seed and the chia seed both contain a plant chemical that called lignans, which you mentioned, and that can, can help to heal the lining of the gut. Thank you. We can have the next one. Okay, I have two questions. One, now that we talked about the stomach, there's this issue of... Uh, mixing vegetables and fruits okay so what really happens in the stomach that is one and then number two uh there's this uh, documentary i was watching about the pancreas and it was saying something about uh the beta cells of the pancreas being destroyed in an autoimmune response so what are these causes i mean what will bring about an autoimmune response that would go and start destroying parts of uh, the, the gut. Thank you. Okay, I'll, ask, I'll answer that one first. Um, Dr. Colin Campbell, he shows that when people are eating dairy and have an inability to break it down, then partially digested proteins get into the blood. And what happens is the, um, the immune system creates antibodies to deal with those molecules but those molecules of partially digested milk protein are very similar in structure to the beta cells in the pancreas and so they can start destroying the beta cells in a pancreas you see god never made the human body to destroy itself something has happened mm -hmm. and so when people are labeled with autoimmune diseases i i actually don't take any notice of that I look at their symptoms and then I look at where their symptoms started and then I investigate why um, that is happening in the body. Because Proverbs 26 verse 2 states that the curse causeless shall not come. So an mm. autoimmune disease doesn't just come, there's a reason. And Dr. John Clark, he's an American doctor, and he gives meetings showing that Childhood vaccinations can cause autoimmune diseases in a person in their 30s and 40s. So there's, so there's another causative factor for autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. So the first question, what was the first question? Ask it again. Ah, oh, the acid, the uh, combining fruits and vegetables. So I read in the writings of Ellen White many years ago that we should not... Uh, mixed fruit and vegetables with a meal. 
And then as a nutritionist, I looked at different uh, vegetables and different fruits and analysed them. And what I found was that vegetables are high in fibre, high in minerals and low in sugars. Whereas fruit is high in fibre, high in sugars but low in minerals. So they don't actually mix that well together. And it appears when someone does not have any gut problems, they can mix the fruit and vegetables and it doesn't appear to cause a problem. But if someone has a sensitive stomach, often they will tell you that, ah, stomach's not working well when those things are mixed. Ideally, we don't mix them because we want to look after this gut. So, um, and the other quandary that to, to some people is that there's a group of fruit, because the classification of a fruit is it has its seed in it. And there is one classification of fruit that are actually low in sugars. And that is the lemon, the avocado, the tomato, the cucumber, the zucchini, uh, eggplant, squash, pumpkin. And it is true. So I, I call that, that uh, classification of fruit that can go either way. They can mix with vegetables because they are also low in the sugars and they also appear to mix okay with fruit. I trust that answers your question. Yes, I think, okay. Uh, sorry, I have to be back again. Um, we know the indigestive problems with dairy, uh, but in Kenya we go to one particular community, the Maasai community. And I was wondering, uh, they appear to do better in dairy than other uh, tribes. That is true. And I was wondering, is it connected to anything about the gut profile, the strains of bacteria that they got in their gut, or why do um, they do better? In some ways it is. I have a friend who has an orphanage in Nakuru, and they were taking in baby orphans and they always give them soy milk. But they got a few Maasai babies and the Maasai babies were not doing well on the soy milk. <laughs> and so the, the man got a cow and started milking the cow and the Maasai babies did very well on the, on the cow's milk. Because they have been drinking the cow's milk for centuries, their guts have developed the enzymes that break down the cow's milk and they, they do well on the cow's milk. And so it is, it is true that our heritage has a lot to do also with our digestion. Mm -hmm. Final one before we give, um, we talked about papaya and uh, papaya fruit and of course uh, pineapple. Is it advisable to have them probably half an hour before any kind of food? Are they going to have vegetables to boost gut integrity? Uh, no, it is not an idea and the reason for this is that digestion takes three and a half to four hours and then the stomach loves a one hour rest. And so when you have it half an hour before the meal, um, it, it actually does not help. You're far better to eat your food together and then leave your stomach alone. Mm -hmm. Just let it do its work. Yes. You, you would have to eat a lot of the papaya and a lot of the bromeline to get fully the benefits. That's why it's far better to use the ex extracts if you're using it medicinally. Or you could also dry your, your papaya seeds and put them in your, in your um, pepper grinder and grind that all over your food. I have two more questions from our live audience here. There's a growing trend of autism in children. What is the cause and how can this be prevented? We have a book in our library at home called uh, Stop Autism Now. And it's by Dr. Bruce Fife and he acts as a medical journalist in studying autism. And the first three chapters looks at the causes of autism. And he has found in probably easily 90% of cases it was due to the childhood vaccines. So the reason why childhood vaccines cause autism is because the vaccines contain neurotoxins. In 1998 they banned mercury from the childhood vaccines. 
but there are still two neurotoxins in the vaccines today and one is aluminium and the other one is formaldehyde. So children are still succumbing to autism through the childhood vaccines. And the other, the other is that there are probably about four times the vaccines given to babies today than even 20 years ago. Mm. So it's really just a total overload. And Dr. Vera Schneibner, she wrote a whole book on it. She, the title of her book is 100 Years of Orthodox Research Proves that vaccinations are an onslaught to an immature immune system. Mm. And she, uh, one of the titles of the chapters in her books is that vaccines cause cot deaths. So in some children, they don't even survive them. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the question is, what's the causes of autism? That's probably the main cause. Um, something else to prove this is in America there's a group of people called the Amish, mm -hmm. you may have heard, and they, they still uh, dress like people in uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and they do not vaccinate their children, they've almost got zero autism. Occasionally there might be autism through some other factors, um, uh, exposure to moles or chemicals that can damage the nerves, the nerves. But um, and sometimes with the Amish, there's a little bit of inbreeding mm -hmm. that that can contribute to such a thing. So then the question is, how can you recover from autism? Because sure. you know, once the vaccines happened, it has happened. Dr. Bruce Fife showed that when you stop those five allergens, which is peanuts oats, wheat, dairy, refined sugar, mm -hmm. he says 50% improvement. And on top of that, if you start giving the child coconut oil, and for children to have coconut oil, an easy way to give it to them is to make like a natural chocolate out of it. Put some carob powder in and some, um, uh, some ground coconut, maybe a little bit of tahini to make it smooth, some ground nuts and seeds, and after they've eaten all their vegetables, yes. <laughs> they can have a square of the natural chocolate. That's an easy way for children to take mm -hmm. in yeah, the coconut. Mm -hmm. There is one last question. It is encouraged to cook with spices. Do these spices affect our stomach when we cook with them? And which spices are safe and which ones are not? There are some herbs slash spices that uh, promote digestion and there are some that can interfere. There are so many herbs, I'm probably far better to just show you the few that do irritate. And one is black pepper, mm -hmm. another is uh, mustard, another is chili, whereas cayenne pepper can uh, improve digestion because cayenne pepper, a lot of people veer away from it because it's a stimulant, but they don't realise it's not a nervous system stimulant like caffeine or nicotine, it's a blood stimulant. Mm. And the blood is the healer of the flesh and anything that stimulates blood to an area is a healer. Whereas all your natural herbs like your, your basil, your oreganos, your thymes, they are all digestive aids. I think with that, we have come to the end of our evening online program. We're so thankful you found time to be with us. I hope you've learned many things. Indeed, there's so much that we can do to take care of our gut health. And if we don't take care of it, you know, if you abuse the stomach, it will abuse you. If you afflict the stomach, actually, that's the quote, it will afflict you. So we need to really take care of our gut health. That's all we have for this evening. See you tomorrow, same time, same place. Bye-bye from us. Okay. We stand up and pray. <laughs> Take your clock.